Mr. Michael Verardi, who is our next speaker, is honored us today by attending our conference. Please welcome Mr. Verardi to the stage. We completed an eight-hour workshop when he picked up the phone himself personally and called an unknown Louis Stanser to congratulate him for downloading the Song on iTunes. Know your product inside out. Know your competitors inside out. Because if you do, you have an advantage. You have freedom of mind. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on which time zone you're in. It's our sixth episode of the Customer Experience Show, where we get to pick the brains of people from experts from leadership, influence, customer service, and customer experience. I'm so happy today to welcome Jonah Berger, who is a marketing professor at the Warden School at the University of Pennsylvania, an internationally best-selling author with his three books, Contagious, Invisible Influence, and The Catalyst. Dr. Berger is a world-renowned expert on change, word of mouth, influence, consumer behavior, and how products, ideas, and behaviors catch on. He has published over 50 articles in top tier academic journals uh, like uh, New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and he has keynoted hundreds of uh, keynotes for organizations the likes of Google, Apple, Nike, and so many more. Dr. Berger, welcome to the Customer Experience Show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. So let's let's say to our all our friends and fans that we have. Uh, two parts in this show. The first part, we get to ask uh, Jonah questions. And in the second part, we open it all to you so you can ask your questions too. So Jonah, let's start with our first question. Let me take you back to your uh, early years and ask you what prompted you to study human behavior instead of environmental engineering, for example. You know, I, I, growing up, I was always interested in the hard sciences, so math, science, computer science, uh, the ability to quantify things through experimentation, through uh, research, and through data analysis. Um, uh, but I started to realize, sort of moving from uh, high school to college, uh, there's actually possible to quantify things in the social world. I was taking a class uh, actually as a freshman in college where they talked about how we build buildings uh, shapes the way people raise their children. So the idea very simply was, look, when we live in small houses, everyone can play out front because we can see people. But when we move to apartments, uh, parents may not want to let their kids outside because they can't see them. It's so far down below. Uh, and so it changes the way that children are raised. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Um, you know, might there be more that I could learn about this space? And so I started diving into social psychology and sociology and even some aspects of consumer behavior in marketing. Uh, and what's been great is to apply these tools of rigorous experimentation and data and statistics to social uh, understanding, right? To understand why some products and ideas catch on, why some things become popular, how consumers make the decisions that they make, um, and how by understanding all these things, we can be more effective both at home and at, and at work. It's good to hear because in four days I'm moving from an apartment to a house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, I loved your book, Contagious, and uh, it was a great read. I highly recommend it to all our friends and uh, followers. And there I learned a lot about how to generate word of mouth. And so as to apply with the, our program, I want to ask you the following. What is, in your opinion, the role of customer experience in generating word of mouth for a company. You know, what's interesting is that um, everyone now agrees that word of mouth is much more effective than traditional advertising. If you if you look at the research, you know, advertising is sometimes good uh, at raising awareness, but most time advertising doesn't work, right? Uh, in part because people don't trust it. They know that a company is going to say positive things about themselves, but because of that, the information the company provides isn't that diagnostic. And so if we're a company, if we're an organization, well, how do we get attention for what we're doing? We know how to buy advertising, but if advertising works, uh, doesn't work, what does? And that's really where word of mouth comes in, 
right? People trust uh, and listen to their colleagues and their friends and their peers much more than they listen to ads. They know they can trust that information and that information is much more targeted. Um, but one question is, well, how do we get more word of mouth? How do we get people to talk about and share what we're doing? And that's where things like customer experience really come in. As I talk about in Contagious, you know, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why some products and services and ideas get talked about more than others. It's about the psychology of social transmission. It's about why we talk about some things rather than others. And customer experience can certainly be uh, a generator uh, of that word of mouth. Uh, in the United States, for example, there's a, a very famous brand called Zappos uh, that has spent no money on advertising. They take all the money that they would have spent in advertising and they pour it into great customer service, great customer experience. Why? Uh, because they know if customers have a great experience, they'll tell others, right? And so they use it as a generator uh, of word of mouth. Um, everything from product design and customer experience to even price uh, can be a generator of word of mouth if we understand why, right? If we understand why people talk, why people share, and use these tools to generate discussion. You're one of the few authors that I admire listening to, speaking, and also reading your books. Easy to understand. That's excellent. And I was also saddened by the news that Tony Shi has died very recently, yeah. uh, the owner of Zappos. Yeah, sad news. Yeah, very sad. So can you tell us a, a bit more about your new gem, your brand new book, Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind? Uh, sure. Tell us a few things about it, please. Why should yeah. someone read it? You know, uh, so contagious uh, writing contagious changed my life uh, a little bit. So as you mentioned, I'm an academic. I work at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. I uh, love doing academic research. have taught there now for almost 15 years, uh, doing research on a variety of things. Um, when contagious change came out, that changed my life a bit. I was doing mostly research, very little bit of consulting. Um, suddenly, I was getting calls from all sorts of companies uh, and organizations, from uh, Google and Nike and Apple to small startups, from US companies to companies all around the world, uh, ask them to help get their products to catch on, their services to become more successful, um, build influence, uh, and so on. And so I learned a lot about marketing from doing that. Um, and I realized at the core, uh, almost every client I was working with had the same problem, which is they all had something that they wanted to change, right? Uh, whether it's uh, marketers uh, or salespeople wanted to change customer or consumer behavior. Uh, think about leaders wanted to transform organizations. Uh, employees wanted to change their bosses' minds. Startups wanted to change industries. Nonprofits wanted to change the world. But change is really hard. Uh, often we push and we pressure and we cajole and, and nothing happens. And so the very simple question I started to ask was, well, could there be a better way? Could there be a way to change minds uh, and incite action, not by pushing, not by pressuring, not by adding more facts or more figures or more reasons and more information, but by doing something else? Very simply by identifying the barriers to change and removing them. And it's a very subtle shift uh, in the way we think about change, right? Usually we think it's about facts and figures and, and reasons. If there's a chair in the middle of the room, for example, and we want to move a chair, pushing it is a great way to go. And so we apply that same idea to people. If I just push people a little more, they'll go. If I give them more facts, more figures, more reasons, more information, they'll move. Uh, but there's a problem. People aren't chairs. When we push chairs, chairs go. When we push people, they push back. They dig in their heels, they think about all the reasons why what we're suggesting is a bad idea. They become less likely to do it, not more. And so what we have to do is rather than pushing harder, we have to figure out what those barriers are that are getting in the way and how to mitigate them. And so that's exactly what the Catalyst does. It talks about the five common barriers that come up again and again. Uh, it identifies them, it talks about the psychology behind them, and it talks about how we can mitigate them. You know, it's just like if you, if you get in a car, for example, and you're parked on a hill, you get in the car, you stick your key in the ignition, you put your foot on the gas. If the car doesn't go, we often think we need more gas. Uh, but too often what we don't do is look to the side and notice the parking brake is depressed, right? Great catalysts don't say, well, what could I do to get someone to change? Great catalysts say, well, why haven't they changed already? What's stopping them? What are the obstacles or barriers that are getting in the way? How can I mitigate those barriers? And by mitigating them, how can I drive change? Excellent metaphors, analogies to get your point across, Jonah. Uh, you answered uh, the next two questions. I don't want to hear all the five key buyers because we don't have the, the time to hear all five. But can you tell us one or two of your favorite key barriers and can you analyze them a bit? If it's too many, just tell us one key barrier. 
I'll tell you just a simple one, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite is something called reactants. Uh, and it's the first one of the five. Um, and there was this funny example from a few years ago that illustrates it really nicely. So I don't know if uh, your audience is familiar with Tide Pods, but they're these little laundry pods that you drop in um, the, the um, washing machine to get laundry done faster and easier. And so uh, Tide comes up with these. They want to uh, reduce the mess and fuss of doing laundry. It would actually be better if uh, some detergent enters at different parts of the process. So they create these little, basically, capsules that you toss in the laundry uh, and make doing laundry easier. They spend $100 million in marketing. Uh, they're doing OK, and then they hit a problem, which is that people are eating them. And I want to say that again, in case it wasn't clear, people are eating them. You might say, well, aren't they filled with chemicals? They are, but people are eating them, right? And so there's a funny video saying they look good enough to eat. There was a satirical article online. Suddenly, most young people, mainly young people, are, are doing this. It's called the Tide Pod Challenge. And so imagine a Tide executive in this situation. You're sitting there going, well, what should we do? People shouldn't be eating them in the first place, but they are. So they release an announcement saying, don't eat Tide Pods. And in case that wasn't enough, they hire a bunch of celebrities to record public service announcements saying, don't eat Tide Pods. And they thought that would be it, right? Uh, you look at the data, you see something really interesting, right? There's sort of attention to Tide Pods is going along. They release these announcements. You'd think that tension would go down, right? That telling people not to do something would make them less likely to do it. Exact opposite. Attention goes way up, right? Uh, uh, searches online go up by 400%. Visits to poison control go up as well. Essentially, a warning becomes a recommendation. Telling people not to do something makes them more likely to do it. And this is sort of a funny uh, example, and I talk about it at length in the book, but it's an example of a much larger phenomenon, right? When we tell people to do something or we tell them not to do something, they often do the exact opposite because people want to feel like they're in control, that they have choice, that they are driving their choices. And when we tell them what to do, it impinges on their belief or their ability to make the choices for themselves, right? Essentially, people have an ingrained anti-persuasion radar, almost like a missile defense system that goes off when they feel like they're being persuaded. And so when people push them, they push back. They ignore, they avoid, or even worse, they counter-argue. They think about all the reasons why what is being suggested is a bad idea. And so that's the science of reactants. In the book, I talk about a lot about how to deal with it. But it's essentially, rather than persuading people, getting people to persuade themselves. right? Rather than selling people, getting people to buy in, giving them back freedom and autonomy, allowing them to make choices, guiding those choices, but allowing them to make choices will make them more likely to move in the right direction. Excellent. So instead of telling them what to do, uh, if I recall well, maybe we should give them choices on what to do, and then they get to choose themselves. Yeah, I mean, we don't have time now because I know we're supposed to uh, take questions from the audience, but yeah. you know, everything from asking rather than telling. Right? Don't tell people what to do, ask them questions, but ask the right questions to guide the journey. Um, rather than giving people one option when making a presentation, give them a few options and ask them which one they like best. Right, Because they're focused on what they like best, they're much more likely to choose one rather than think about all the reasons why they don't like what you suggested. Right, Giving them back some of that freedom and, and autonomy. Excellent. Uh, Jonah, you've been doing a lot of research. My feeling is that we're going through a turmoil and economic downturn. Uh, last question from our side before we release it to our audience is what advice would you give to viewers who are leaders of small businesses so they can be the catalyst towards a more positive future? What would you say? You know, I think a lot of us um, are having a difficult time. And that's not surprising, right? Uh, the economy's down. Um, lots of folks have lost their jobs. There's um, uh, lots of things we usually do we can no longer do. Um, but while there's a lot of uncertainty, I think there's also a lot of opportunity. Right? Uh, it's very hard to get customers and consumers to change. It's very hard to get them to switch from what they've been doing before uh, to new things. Yet we've all been forced to switch, and we're being much more willing to switch in a wide variety of domains. And so now's really the opportunity to get people to switch to you. If you're a small business, to get more customers, both to retain the existing ones and build your businesses. If you understand why people change and why they don't, we can change anything. Excellent. Great. Let me read some of the comments before we release it to the audience. Zeno Angelidis, all the way from New York, says hello to Jonah and myself. Uh, from Greece, uh, Georgios Kokinellis, Stathis Tassis from Cyprus, Mike Papapavlou, again from the US. And uh, Sofia, uh, let me open it up to you. Anna Hanzi says hello. So, Sofia, can you please have uh, some of the questions for Jonah so he can let us? Of the answer just before we wrap it up. 
Yeah, so we have five minutes left and we have a question that came um, uh, before the show, if you can answer it to us. And the question is about, um, so the person who sent it is George. He has a marketing company and he wants to uh, convince uh, or let's say create posts that are viral for his company he knows there are many marketing companies out there and he feels like his job is um, maybe similar to other people so can you give us a few tips on how he can create more uh, posts online that are read by more people and have more reactions yeah, I mean, that's really what the first book, I don't know where it is here, let's see. That's really what Contagious is all about, right? So um, uh, the orange one, all about why things go viral, all about why people talk, why they share, and, and why they don't. Um, and so in that book, I share a framework called the STEPS framework that stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, uh, public, practical value, and stories. Each of those is a psychological driver of why people talk, why people share, and leads all sorts of products, services, uh, and ideas to catch on. It's not random, it's not luck, it's not chance. Right? There's a science behind why people share and why they don't. Uh, and if we understand that science, we can craft more contagious content. We can get more views and attention and, and shares, and, and we can get our stuff to catch on. Um, you know, I think many organizations think the goal is to make something viral, right? to shoot a viral video and get millions uh, of views. But the goal is really to create interest and engagement in all of our content. Right, um, from you know one video to the next. Most um, most businesses don't want to be a flash in the pan, sort of here today, gone tomorrow. They want to create enduring interest for everything they're doing. And so, content online is certainly one way to do that, but that's not the only way. Right? Uh, if you actually look about what percent uh, of all word of mouth is online, from uh, 100 all the way down to zero, uh, the number might surprise you. It's actually only about 10 to 15 percent of all word of mouth is online. Uh, most of it is actually offline face-to-face. -face. Now, in the pandemic, that's certainly changed. Most of us aren't going out uh, as much as we were before, but most word of mouth uh, is, and, and at least we'll be back in a couple of years once the pandemic is over, face-to-face. Um, -face. People talking to family members at the breakfast table, talking to their colleagues at work, uh, grabbing a beer with their friend after work. Most word of mouth uh, is face-to-face. -face. And so rather than focusing on the technology, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, uh, and you know, think about just content online, we need to focus on the psychology. Why do people talk? Why do people share? What about certain content makes it more likely to be passed on? And how can we use that to engineer and, and craft more contagious stuff? And so that's really what all the steps are about. Uh, feel free to check. Um, there's a bunch of resources on my website. So a guide to the steps, a one pager, you know, um, a guide all about how to craft contagious content. I think those will be great places to start. I've made a photocopy of your steps and I keep it next to my desk and uh, I always ponder the question to myself. So we only we also have a viral post. Oh, <laughs> uh, good. Glad to hear. One thing we forgot to tell you, Jonah, is that from all our guests, we ask them uh, as a present if they can sign a book and send it to one of our lucky winners. They have all done it up to now. So we would ask for Contagious since uh, we talked so much about Contagious, if you can do that to one lucky winner. I would be happy to. Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. We truly appreciate that. Uh, George Frosini says, great discussion. Thanks for the questions and answers. And he's asking the following question. Is there any tools that quantifies the attention of people on a specific matter, something similar to Google Trends? Sure. Yeah. And, and I think we're almost out of time. So I'm happy to answer this yeah. question and uh, then we can wrap up. But yeah. um, in terms of quantifying attention, Google Trends is great for search data, right? So it gives you a very good sense of sort of what people are searching for. There's similar tools for social media, right? So sort of social media listening tools that allow you to put a brand in or a product or a service or a message and get a sense uh, of, uh, you know, how much attention there is. Everything from, uh, you know, a company called Crimson Hexagon to a variety of others. If you type in uh, social listening, a lot of these tools will come up. Um, uh, those don't tell you uh, everything about what's going on, but give you some sense of attention to a, a given uh, name or, or brand. Okay. And Jonah, just one last thing. Uh, how has COVID transformed human life? Has it transformed it? In your case, for example, has it transformed your life? This is a question from a guy from, uh, New from uh, the USA, so I had to yeah. ask you. 
Oh, but, certainly. I mean, right from, uh, you know, not being able to go into the office to not being able to go into the gym to ordering things online. I mean, it, it certainly changed, I think, many aspects of consumer and customer behavior. I think what's interesting is not to think about whether they've changed, but whether those changes will stick. Right? That's really the interesting question. Which of these things will stick around and, and which won't? And I think it really comes down to understanding the sort of the psychology of things, uh, how they work and, and habits. You know, I talk a lot about in Contagious about triggers as, as how they kick off a habit loop. And I, I think that's quite relevant here as well. Thank you very much. Sophia, anything else or shall I wrap it up? Excellent. Uh, we have one very Great. quick. Sorry, guys, I have I have yeah. to I have to go. Yeah. So let's. We have uh, to go. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. then we just, close it. Just thank wrap you very it up. much. Uh, a very big thank you to all our fans and friends. Jonah has been uh, excellent today. He told us that if you want to raise kids that are up front, take them to houses. Don't let them live in apartments. <laughs> he told us that word of mouth will always beat uh, marketing and advertising because. It's what they say about you. It's not what you say about yourself. He told us also that uh, it's important not to eat our Tide Pods, but we should put them into our laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, he said that his life has changed as all of our lives have changed. Jonah, thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much for having for me. For your wisdom. Thanks okay. a lot. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Greatly appreciate it.